there is a there is a written version of the year end report that I would uh, encourage you to take a look at because it's got detailed data on the uh, PowerPoint that I'm doing here. I have to cut things down so people can see stuff e easily, but the uh, year end report is much more detailed. Uh, the, the photos that you see, one is a uh, Google Earth photo from this year in May. And the other one is your previous photo from what Long Lake looked like in 2015. One of the things that uh, I have been interested in is trying to get uh, remote sensing types of data uh, taken on, uh, on your lake. In Wisconsin, they have a very active program and there are literally hundreds of their lakes that are uh, scanned in remote sensing and they have a um, ground truthing program to validate what's in the lake versus what the images are that they get from the, uh, from the uh, remote sensing. Part of the reason for that is I'm concerned about having a better definition of what constitutes a bloom for, uh, for Long Lake. And there obviously there are times when you get a small isolated section of the lake that uh, has an algal bloom. There are other times when you get relative, you get a bloom, but it's not real intense other times where you get a bloom that looks like 2015. One of the things I'm working on from the future is having a way to get a better definition of what constitutes a bloom. That's not just a problem for me. The other folks that are busy studying this whole deal have that same issue. It is a common issue. Um, This is a uh, graph that could not have been done were it not for Joe Popek. Joe, yes, we should clap, indeed. What this shows is the rainfall uh, uh, at the Long Lake weather station over a seven month period. And what you see is there's three rainfalls that are greater than one inch. And when you take a look from the beginning, um, March, going through all the way up to this period of time in July, there's hardly any rainfall whatsoever in that period of time. That is a very, very long protracted period of time to have such little rainfall. When Gloria and I went out to take a look at, at uh, streams to monitor the stormwater. This, what we saw is there was no stormwater. It wasn't coming through all the way up to the inlet to the lake. So what you have is a period of time. You have a period of time where that is a drought. And that was formally designated as a drought by the a group that uh, uh, does that for uh, our, um, uh, that grades droughts across the country. So it, it, our particular area was graded as a D4 severe drought for this past year. But what that means is if you have minimal flow and seven months of drought, you get minimal loading. Now, so that's one of the factors that will generate a bloom. Having sedentary water is conducive to blooms as well. And uh, so you, you can't rule out you're gonna get some blooms even though you have no external loading. That makes for a very unique period of time. And when you take a look at some of the other data, it would be important to take a look at what the loading represents. 
also, Joe needs to have his weather station upgraded. He needs to get an anemometer so he can grade out the winds, wind speed, needs to get a minimum maximum th thermometer for his station. And the other thing that I'm going to recommend is Riverwatch has got a type of data logger that is cheap, has got cheap software, and you can log the temperature of the epilimnion to almost continuously for months at a time. So you get a, a really great record of the water temperatures through time. All of those sorts of things, managing water is a systems analysis. All of those things have the potential to have a bearing on your expre on expressed blooms. This is RJ's work. And RJ is to be thanked as well as Joe. And his, his, his records are just have been exceptionally important for the, for the lake community. Uh, this, these are a, a record of the Secchi disk values for your uh, lake. Those red arrows the, uh, that you see there are periods of time or approximate periods of time in which you've had a bloom. And it was, there was only three blooms across the, the season, as near as I can tell, based on the records that I got from RJ. Now, at least two of those blooms, uh, the first one up here, I believe that this bloom was based on the phenomena in the lake where you came, came into getting a stratification for the first time. The middle one, uh, I'm, it, I'm, I, I cannot, identify for sure, but you notice that the, uh, the, there's an event that's taking place here where, you're, where your Secchi disks are dropping as well. And then the last one is at Lake Turnover. So you had three events, at least two of them were associated with very substantial lake, physical lake uh, uh, episodes. And again, one of the things that I'd like to try and be able to do through time is get a better way to identify what uh, of, of the character of your blooms are. This represents the temperature DO profiles that you have. This one is for June 24th, and this is for dissolved oxygen. And this is when I believe that you were, it was beginning to stratify and you were getting your first bloom. And you, you notice how strong the stratification is. And uh, you notice that the DO uh, even is going down to zero at uh, a full 10 feet. So it wasn't just two or three feet along the lake bottom, but the entire 10 feet was, was here and that has a bearing. Remember, you, you have very little flow, very little water passing through. And what you're seeing is the lake stratified and there's very little mixing going on that, uh, that uh, has a bearing on this. And that being the case, you had a long period of time when you had anox uh, anoxia through a very large section of the lake. Jim, uh, can you explain what DO is? Dissolved oxygen, dissolved oxygen. Um, the, and you'll notice that once the lake turned over, and this is a little bit past the turnover point, that's about as homogeneous as any lake I've ever seen. Uh, that, that is uh, great da data uh, in terms of what was taking place with your fall turnover. You had a large amounts of hypolimnetic water from the bottom coming up into the epilimnion during that period of time. And you'll see the impact that it had uh, on the lake. Another thing that I wanna point out here is something that 
is important to understand. Once you get the epilimnion and it's stable, the, the lake is stratified, that does not mean that the epilimnion isn't subject to mixing events. Jim, uh, can you explain what epilimnion is? Epilimnion is the, there are three uh, strata that get created in the lake. Epilimnion is the top strata. Metalimnion is what's in the middle. And hypolimnion is what's below. So if you go back to here, all of this stuff is in the hypolimnion. That's the deepest part of the lake. This is the metalimnion where you get that, the, the break in things. And then the epilimnion is up here. So oh, stupid, like, stupid question, but the higher the dissolved oxygen level, the better, correct? Uh, generally, yes. And what's, <laughs> it's, no questions are stupid. <laughs> please don't, yeah, please don't say that. Yeah. What's up is that uh, fish have got a DO requirement of at least five DO. So okay. what you look, look for is to make certain that in that epilimnion where you've got all the fish that you have at least a 5DO uh, for it. Got it, thank you. Okay, and questions are allowable while I'm doing this. So don't, uh, don't hesitate. This is an abbreviated um, chart of the values for total P and for um, chemistries for the epilimnion. Now we'll go down one by one for some of this. This is alkalinity, total Keldahl nitrogen, ammonia, and you notice that there's no value for ammonia up here. Nitrate, total phosphorus. Now you see the total phosphorus value as 0.033. The state uh, regulatory guideline for lakes is 0 0.05. So that's below the state, damn it. Uh, that's below the state regulatory gu guideline for there. And then you have SRP. There is a, a very big deal with the SRP um, be because it can be expressed as phosphate or it can be expressed as phosphorus. In the past, it was the data for it was given, us, given back to us as phosphate. Well, that's three times the actual value of what the, the actual phosphorus value is. And the SRP is called soluble, uh, reactive phosphorus, that's what's bioavailable. What this is, is the phosphorus that's tied up. It's bound to sediment. It's tied up in algae. It's got all sorts of things. And then there's some free phosphorus that's part of it as well. Total phosphorus or total P means just that. It's a uh, conglomerate of a variety of different types of phosphorus. SRP is the stuff that's soluble and is available to react with, with new algae for what you have. Total suspended solids is a value of um, the, the types of solids that are in the water column. Um, the other things are more difficult, uh, have, are somewhat more difficult to explain, and they're not going to be relevant to what we're talking about. Most of this for the epilimnion for this year was pretty similar to what you've had in previous years. However, during that late fall, the late fall, the turnover took place, and then you suddenly got a large amount of phosphorus in the epilimnion. But if you took a look at it, it's not terribly different than what you, you've seen in the past. Contrast that with what's happening here 
you have unique numbers of ammonia, total phosphorus, soluble reactive phosphorus that you have never seen before in 20 plus years. So it's a very, very unique year for your lake. And, and um, what, what does that mean, Jim? Well, it, it means that these values, if you go down to here, we're going to take a look and remember that uh, ammonia and nitrogens are things that can modify the character of the algae bloom. You have the highest value for ammonia that your lake has ever seen. In the bottom layer. In the bottom. But remember, it comes back up as part of the fall turnover. Right. So you have very, very high values of that. You have total, damn it. You have total phosphorus that uh, is exceptionally high. It's 1.97. I don't think you've ever seen that uh, in your lake. So what you have there is some very, very unique types of water chemistries this past year. And Jim, is that taken from like an average of different spots where they test or, or how do they come up with those numbers? Uh, that's taken, it's taken from, there's three, sp there's three spots that he does the Secchi disc in. Uh, and I, there's two spots that I think RJ does, uh, um, but I'm not. Comment on that real quick. The, the water samples are taken from location two, which is in the center of the lake, uh, just off of Pickerel Point. Good. The only point that we do the water collection from is that same point every time. There are three established points in the lake that we take water clarity from, but for the water samples, just the one point. Yeah, and you do take samples from uh, the outlet. Uh, and at times we take samples from the inlet as well. Uh, the outlet sample should mirror what's going on in the lake. But, uh, but, but bottom line is that. Now, these charts show what it looks like on average. You know, the, we went back and we took a look and got all of the data for the 20 plus years where you've been doing, uh, doing that sampling. In this chart, I left off 2021 because you have uh, some trending in the ammonia data, trending downward in the ammonia data based on the, the uh, data sets that go back to 1995 already to, two, uh, uh, to 220. So there are some trends in your, in your data that look evident from that. However, as soon as you hit 2021, if I charted this the same way I did this, you'd have this. You can see that your hypolinetic total P and SRP for a long leg is profoundly different from anything you've had in the past. This is a really interesting year for you. You can almost call it a control year because you don't have external loading. It's all internal loading for the most, for the most part. So, so Jim, what, what would you hypothesize that we're getting no uh, external loading, so nothing's coming in the lake, and our lower level, the hypolimnium, is sky high for phosphorus? Um, the hypolimnium. Oh, nitrogen. The hypolimnium is still generating ammonia and total P from off of the sediments. So remember, it's anoxic for 10 feet above it. So you had larger anoxia in the lake than you probably have ever had before. Oh. So you have stuff generated the, there. And then in the, the first part of the, the, the first bloom that you got was probably due to the fact of the lake stratified. So it's still bringing stuff up from the previous year to stratify, or, and once it stratifies, it brings up some legacy for, uh, of nutrients 
from the previous year. And you got that early season bloom, and then you got the late season bloom. And I'm not quite sure why you got the mid season bloom. Well, the one thing that I could add to that is um, while we didn't have water coming in this year, there were also large portions of the year where we did not have water going out. So it really did get stagnant. The lake dropped below the top of the spillway for a good portion of the summer. So I think that might lead to some of the spiking because while I'm sure the sequestered uh, nutrients get leached out every season, as long as the water is always draining, I think that keeps everything a little bit more in balance. So, and, and uh, Joe is right, that sedentary water is something that helps to create blooms. Remember, the lake, the lake thing is a system type of uh, activity and high temperatures and stagnant water can contribute to blooms as well. So it may be some additional sorts of things of that, of that character. My apologies for running through that. So th that, that is a, that's a startling graph. That's really a remarkable uh, shift. Given that number is so high, do you, do you have do you have any concerns that I don't know maybe there was an error or something in the testing? I, I'm just it's such a big number, it just seems it's kind of frightening almost. Uh, no, I think they got it right. Yeah. Okay. I just wow. Jim, um, so just because I'm a little slow here, um, so the we had a a high level. It was it was anoxic for very high and the, the lack of oxygen causes the sediments to release the bound up phosphorus. Right. So we don't know why we were anoxic, but that lack of oxygen. Oh, 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 oh no, you do too know why you're anoxic. What happens is that down below, uh, you know, the sediment itself has got a draw against the water column. It's, it's something called sediment oxygen demand. So it draws the oxygen out of the water column as part of respiration for all of the organic stuff that's already down there as part of the sediment. Um, so it acts on that. And as you go to the, 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 the sediment itself, um, so the sediment itself has got an oxygen demand and that's what creates that lack of oxygen ab above the sediment. The, and this is what Gloria and I found. Now, we went out and we discovered there was no flow. So when you got down here to Route 134 and we put the tennis ball out, it didn't go anywhere. And when you took a look at this spot on Route 60, there were trees growing in the middle of the uh, headwater stream. It was no longer streamlined. The top up here was right below a, uh, a farm field. And uh, I don't know how easy it is for you to see the numbers, but the numbers here are relatively high relative to the nutrients, but there is no flow. So it's, it's not something that's being delivered to the lake, but a possibility exists that it could be in the future. If you go through all of the, these, the turbidity numbers, which will reflect the amount of sediment in the, in the sample are up here in, in bold. And so you notice that 120, it's got a, a much higher turbidity than some of the others. It was difficult even taking samples for these things. And, uh, and while we have those numbers, nutrient numbers that are here, um, this is not going to be delivered to the lake. It's, going to, it's part of a stagnant water for almost the entirety of the watershed. Uh, Route 60 was sprouting trees. Nitrates were surprisingly high. That's something that as we go to the future, 
I'm interested in looking at it much more closely. And I'll explain why in one of the next slides coming up. This is the point source loading. These are the two places in which we are busy uh, monitoring on a monthly basis for the, um, we have total P, but what's coming out of the sewage treatment plant is almost all soluble P. Our first couple of tests validated that everything coming from the sewage treatment plants is SRP, but we can measure it with TP and still get a clear idea of what the, what's coming out of the plant. When you compare, damn it, boy, this is going to be a multi damn it presentation. Um, if you take a look, we use two values for the discharge from the plant, uh, average measured flow and uh, uh, design flow for the plant. I remain hopeful that Dan will give us actual values at the time that he takes the phosphorus test in the future or a monthly value that they have to record. And so that we can get some better flow data from the uh, point sources. The TMDL core here, um, is 153 pounds per year annually. Can you explain what TMDL is? Total maximum daily load. That is what the state has said that they are allowed to discharge. Um, I'm sorry, it's not allowed to discharge. This is what the state, uh, IEPA says, they are discharging. That's grossly different from what we measure as being 10 and a half to 20 pounds per year. If you go down to the Baptist College, we estimated 20 to 66 pounds per year. The state TMDL identified 438 pounds per year. That has to be rectified. You need to get those numbers so that they uh, agree with one another uh, better. Hey, Jim, with those TMDLs uh, that the state is putting out, is that perhaps based on a maximum uh, capacity use of the system and they're not using them and that's why they're not using it to the no, full I didn't use capacity? The, I didn't, or? No, I didn't use the maximum flow for my calculations. And I tried to use what the state does to do their calculations. Gotcha. So, so my calculations are done with the state's method. Yeah, I'm more, I was more wondering if the state's numbers were based off of like the plants operating at a higher capacity than they are actually operating at. Uh, it could be, um, but remember that the TMDL sets numbers that when SMC comes in and does a watershed plan, people will be held to those numbers, okay? And if you take a look at the uh, state's plan for your lake, they want you to reduce loading in amounts that are not realistic for your watershed. So you have to be cautious about those TMDL numbers. Uh, Dr. Lambert from IIT is taking a look at some of those which it pleases me greatly because I think uh, it, it's got some, some uh, types of skill sets that are going to be valuable in, in maybe getting some better numbers. The other thing I'm worried about is Ivanhoe. And of all the places that I'm worried about, we don't have any numbers from Ivanhoe. Ivanhoe is a land application system. They save their sewage effluent from their uh, residential uh, folks into a pond and they save it over the winter. And then during the early spring and other times, they use it to fertilize the golf course 
And there is no obligation for them to monitor the impact of that on the downstream side. That's an example of something that SMC has to look into. Yeah, and Jim, uh, back to the, the point sources, the Bible College and the Fremont School. So they're discharging way less phosphorus than the TMDL thinks they are. Uh, and you think we should be rectifying these numbers? In other words, you think we need to be asking them to bring them down, or are we happy that they're... It should be as part of the TMDL. That's what you're going to be held to. That's what you're going to be held to. Those numbers are the targets that the state says you, you should be meeting as a, as a watershed. And that being the case, you want to make sure that those numbers uh, are accurate and real. And you also remember that you're going to have to bring some things down and lose some loading. Well, where are you going to get it? Are you going to get it from those folks that aren't loading lots of stuff to begin with? So, so the bottom line is the TMDL numbers need to be real. And well, these are the numbers that Gloria takes. The, I think the other conclusion here is, uh, I think, a, I believe an appropriate statement is that both the Bible College and the school complex are well below the expected amount they would be delivering. That's correct, Grant. Jim, so, can you go back to that, that graph showing the, the Bible College and the uh, uh, Fremont School? Uh, up at the top, it says load per year 10.37 and, and to, to 20.74 per year. Yeah. And then up in the top, it says per year. Do you take those numbers? And how do you get that anywhere near 153 pounds per year? You multiply them? Oh, no, load. that's the, the TM. Those numbers, these numbers up in top are the ones I generated. Numbers okay. down below are what the state generated. State allows them to do. so okay did, thank you to be clear though did you say the state allows that or did the state test and come up with that number the state came up with that number in their tmdl analysis so, so they're saying so just to be clear so they're saying it's actually 153 pounds that are leaving fremont yes. and we're saying 10.37 yes wow so i see what you mean there's a huge discrepancy then yeah it appears to be so finding out what's right is what I'm encouraging. Yeah, and I think again, it's important to emphasize that's the key word there is maximum daily load, total right. maximum daily load. So that's what the state is calculating would be uh, an allowable maximum daily load. Yeah, that, that's kind of my point. The state is saying this is allowable based on their calculations, but that's not based on somebody going out and doing a test from the state saying it's 153 actual, right? Yeah, that's correct. What the state does oh, okay. is they the state uses a surrogate yeah, I got it. for that. And then to your point, you're saying if we're going to try to stop load coming in, these places aren't the places to be looking at because it doesn't look like much is coming in. It, it certainly doesn't look like it I'm based on, on the performance things that we're seeing from them. Got and it. bless their hearts, they have been great. They've re really been highly cooperative. And Dan, that is the operator for that, is terrific. Um, I'm concerned about Ivanhoe. I'm not, I'm not concerned about Fremont or the Baptist College. I am concerned about what Ivanhoe might represent. Um, this is Gloria's uh, data uh, oh, with the um, algal tests for microsystem, uh, the Abraxas test. This is her, her chart for 2019. And I only highlighted those numbers that are 10 or above. So in 2019, when you had a fair amount of stuff coming in, you had uh, a bunch of hits on it. 
then in 2020, fewer. And in 2021, only one that uh, hit, hit that number. And even though you had a bloom in September, uh, you did not have any sort of toxicity. And that's, uh, now they, the, one of the things about that is that runs counter to what we have been seeing in the, in the literature. So in the literature, we're seeing things where you get high nitrogen and late season blooms as being toxic. But in this particular case, Gloria's values were not. And um, it, the one thing about this is that should not be read as a trend. You can't say that. This, uh, when we're talking about what's an outlier, 2021 may be an outlier for you. It may not be a representative year. And this is Gloria's work crew, by the way. Uh, notice, uh, notice their sampling technique. They've got gloves, got masks, and they've got Gloria to give them uh, a direction. This is an important slide. We mentioned that uh, it not, it's not just phosphorus that winds up being important for uh, expression of uh, algae. What you see over here is an experiment that was done by uh, a group that works out of Lake Erie. And what they did is they set up planktothrix, which is a type of blue-green algae, and put um, water samples uh, uh, probably distilled water in all of those containers. Then they, in the control, that's probably just uh, distilled water, nothing else, and planktothrix. In the second one, you have phosphate only. And you notice the, the yellow color to that. And, uh, it, and that's, that, that suggests that you're not getting uh, a very, very significant uh, uh, algal uh, growth. And then uh, they did some with nitrogen only and still got blooms. And then they did some with nitrogen and phos phosphorus. And uh, what it, it is significant of is that there needs to be not only phosphorus, but nitrogen to be able to get uh, certain sorts of blooms. What you see here is now there are a number of different forms uh, of nitrogen. One is ammonia, NH, uh, NH3 or NH4. Second is urea. The next is nitrite. The other is nitrate. And then you notice you have atmospheric nitrogen. Not every green, blue green algae can use atmospheric nitrogen. It is only certain sorts of algae that can use uh, uh, molecular nitrogen. One of those types of algae is a phantasomena. What I think is happening in your lake is early spring, you don't get high nitrogen. By the way, when they fertilize corn, in the early spring, the amount of nitrogen they use for the, just to get the corn growing is relatively small amount. Later in June, July, when corn has grown to the eight leaf stage or something like that, they put a lot of nitrogen on the ground for the corn. Early spring, the phantasomena can fix a nitrogen in the water column, other blue greens cannot. Early spring, egg derived nitrogens are relatively low and therefore a phantasomena dominates. 
a phenomena numbers build and they can leak ammonia into the water column. So they've converted the nitrogen to ammonia, which they use, and some of which is, uh, is leaked. And so you can get other forms of blue-green algae that can take over. I think that this is a pattern for your lake, um, but it's testable. So as we look for our future years and we take a look at how the blooms are evolving across time, we can look at that. So for Joe and RJ especially, um, I, I would like to see whatever we need to do to help Joe upgrade his weather station we should do. That's an important thing to do. And there are uh, water temperature loggers that are really cheap uh, that we can get and put around the lake to measure the water temperature. For RJ, it's a little bit more complicated. RJ's stuff is absolutely great, especially the DO temperature charts. Um, IIT has got uh, electronic devices that are really high end. I sat through one of their presentations concerning their work with the mobile kayaks, and they have electronics that are capable of differentiating between blue, green, and other forms of algae. And they've got types of testing, uh, chemical testing, where chlorophyll A and phaophyton are recorded as well. And that would be a very, very good supplement to what uh, RJ does. Inlet and outlet, you're looking with SMC to identify the loading associated with the watershed. Inlet and outlet testing and the historic stuff that we've done needs to be shared with SMC. And it would be great if SMC would give you a small amount of money to help with the monitoring that you already do, because they've got the the job of characterizing that loading. That's the big thing for their 319 program. Stormwater monitoring, same thing. Uh, it needs to be done in collaboration with SMC. Point source monitoring, I can continue with that. Um, IIT has the capability of, of doing a second, um, opinion on the TMDL and um, uh, the possibility exists that maybe we should be looking at uh, ammonia and other things like that that may be coming from point sources. But the biggest deal that uh, I have is, uh, I think that you need to take a look at what's happening with Ivanhoe. Toxics monitoring, um, it expand her Gloria to get some other people to help her and measure more than one part of the lake. And then I'm interested in getting a better definition of what a bloom is. And that might be remote sensing. Uh, IIT is a, a group that um, we have not coordinated with yet, but IIT has got all sorts of stuff that they're capable of doing and have done in another watershed that uh, will be helpful. And then I'm working with Gloria on monitoring of uh, a beaver, a beaver pond and using different types of technology to do the water quality stuff. And then um, there's the year end report and state of the lake. You need to, uh, I'm asking, uh, asking you to give me a little bit more money to be able to do that. It, it takes me a great deal of time to do it. Um, paid for by whom? And then I don't think we'll take you very much further uh, through this. We talked about the monitoring. The 319 is a, an emphasis on loading assessments. It would be great if they coordinated with you 
They obviously have postponed it for a year. Jim, uh, can you explain what you mean by the 319? The th 319 is money that SMC has. And Grant, how much is it? Is it I thought it was 100, and, so 100 plus, 100,000 plus. I think it's about 120, 130,000. Okay. And um, there, there may be modeling that's going on within it. It's very important stuff. It almost certainly, given climate change, your floodplains are going to change. And that's going to be really critically important to the uh, folks on the lake. And then uh, relative to Mud Lake, the reason that I have mentioned Mud Lake to begin with, why I've emphasized it, is the work that Baxter did identifying the performance characteristics of Mud Lake and identifying the fact that it is a spot where you are getting treatment of the watershed effluent before it hits the lake. And you're getting treatment levels at a very high end. If you can bump up the uh, performance values of that, that represents one of the easiest and most straightforward things that you can do. Numbers matter. Getting people to go along with it matters. It's not an easy project to bring off, but I'll encourage you uh, in the idea that um, multiple pieces of the technical work suggest that it's a place where you can get uh, help. Um, I would add the uh, SMC got $122,000 from the IEPA to do the watershed base plan. Okay. The last part of that is uh, planning initiatives for 2022. Uh, 20, Once that 319 plan is finalized, uh, then the likelihood is that um, SMC is going to uh, bring everybody in the watershed together and have a, a collective watershed planning uh, uh, collective watershed planning uh, e events. And th that, can, that can be good or it can be bad. Uh, Round Lake almost certainly will have much more influence concerning what's going on for your watershed. And um, it is the, the one thing we sent forward before is to whatever you do is to get good uh, continuous modeling done uh, for the watershed. And then I have a question for some of you. What is the property across the way from Baxter where there are huge soil uh, piles? What's happening there? Uh, um, Jim, I think I can tell you that uh, oh, yeah. it's, Patrick, there's sorry. like a recycling yard uh, it's going through the city of Round Lake, and they they actually are bringing in different things and sorting it. But a lot of it is trees and roots and all sorts of you know different sized stone and kind of construction debris that's being sorted. And they built the big uh, mounds by the road just to kind of block the you know site of it. But I think they're more sorting kind of like a uh, natural recycling area. That's the area I think you're talking about. Yeah, so to be clear, it's a private company that leased land from the village of Round Lake. That literally is a little corner, a southwestern corner of the village of Round Lake that abuts the forest preserve, the adjacent forest preserve. And um, we found out about this from our um, well, from different ways, but uh, we talked about it with our previous Judy Martini, Lake County board member, Judy who, Martini. Who was also horrified by it. We actually have gone back and pulled the minutes from Round Lake when they first discussed this project, because uh, it was very much under the wire. 
Um, under Judy, the radar. Yeah, under the radar. And, and Judy was shocked that they got the permit for it as well. And when you read the agreement, the agreement says when they're done with the lease, they have to leave the land back in the condition that it was. But when you look at that, that's just like an absurdity. So yeah, I, I think, Jim, that's something we, we mentioned it to SMC once before. We actually did flag that as a concern. I'm not sure. Uh, well, SMC, SMC should be looking all over their shoulders for uh, the soil coming off of their, uh, the sediment coming off of their site. Yep. And uh, the sorts of types of things that I see in place, the BMPs to um, um, prevent that don't look that special to me. But, no. Uh, the devil is in the detail on that. I think Patrick would be in better shape, better position. To... Can I uh, just make a, a comment on this? Just so you guys know, um, that property that's going on that you're discussing is the number one source for mm. tax revenue for the city of Round Lake. That, oh. that private business oh. there has the most money of any single business or residence in the entire district. So... Um, that is probably, I mean, looking at the board, that is probably the person that is most liked on the board because it's the one that's actually helping with the tax well, base the most. Is, now, I agree with you, it deserves to have oversight, and I agree with you, it deserves to make sure the BMPs are actually doing something um, and acting properly to, you know, stabilize the soil, um, you know, make sure there's no water runoff. Make sure, you know, everything is actually the way it should be for, you know, erosion control and, um, you know, stormwater prevention. But I did just wanted to tell you, it is the, you know, it is a very major source of income for the city of Round Lake. So they're not likely to, you know, want to dissolve it early or anything like that. Well, what it does and what it should give you a heads up on is when you proceed to the business of doing a watershed working group, you're going to have multiple interests that are going to be part of that. And what I'm encouraging you to do is get ahead of it. Understand what the process is. Look especially to have oversight of the 319 stuff. And, uh, and then the modeling winds up being really critically important, I, I, I think. And I remain hopeful that SMC has got some good modelers and some of their other projects. So I can hope that it's, it's well done. Uh, the, deal, the deal, that's all folks. Can I have a question? <laughs> any, any other questions you might have? Just Jim, thank you for all the details and all the information. Uh, I can see you, you put tons of time and work into that. So congratulations on being so thorough. Yeah. Sure. Jack, your mute's not working correctly. There you go. Okay. How can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, I have a question. You go back to Mud Lake, Jim. You you mentioned that that's that's being monitored and 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 taken care of, and there's good things coming out of that? Is that by Baxter who is monitoring that? Um, oh, absolutely. Baxter had uh, a million dollar program for a year's period of time that monitored Mud Lake uh, above and below it and corroborated the fact that Mud Lake intercepted at high flow about 80% of your total suspended solids. And then it was less in terms of total phosphorus, but it was, a, it was an enormous amount of, uh, of treatment that you were getting from Mud Lake. And Jim, just to be clear, Jack, just so you understand, that was a one-year study Baxter did in like 2002. It's not an ongoing monitoring. Right, Grant's, Grant's right. Okay, I can't think, think after they made their settlement that they would invest any more money in it. No, so no, they're not. It was a it was a one year study as part of their overall watershed study and monitoring and modeling, and it was part of a um, I guess you could call a verification and validation of modeling that they were doing in parallel. 
Okay, now, thank you. By, by the way, one of the things we've done is talked with uh, uh, Dr. Lambert from IIT and shared the old study that they have. Obviously in 20 plus years, there's gonna be changes in land use, rainfall patterns, all sorts of things. But the possibility exists that you can use some of the material from the old HSP modeling and update it. And if he's capable of doing that, that would go a long ways for uh, uh, addressing some of the TMDL things as well. If Jim, I have a question, and it's about fish. When we have that anoxic layer there in the middle, would the fish be coming up into the epilimbium layer then? Would they be basically... Uh, yes, no, the fish higher? would come up into the uh, epilimbium layer. It segregates, so out, out. it segregates out stuff. And uh, I, I would just interject that there is indeed a student at IIT, Nora, uh, who is... Uh, working on doing modeling for the watershed. Grant and I went kayaking with her. And, and Jim, Grant, relative to SMC stuff, have they identified a, um, a calendar for their work and a, no. and a job? No. Uh, no. A SMC. Job that matches the uh, nine element type of thing? So number one, they're going to follow the nine elements, but no, they are, every communication we've had with them, they are understaffed and overworked right now. And their primary focus, absolutely their primary focus are the projects to spend 25 million a year on stormwater infrastructure. Because that clock is ticking. Because that clock is ticking, and it's $125 million for five years, $25 million a year. And I, I'm going to send Sharon Osterby another message, because she and Mike Priscilla were, were saying at the end of last year that they were going to get back to us with uh, when they might get started. We know that they... I, I want to be clear, they started the process because they had two interns that did stream bank inventory all summer. And that's kind of interesting because they would have had to uh, weed whack through those trees in the Lake <laughs> Helen rain um, since there was no flow, but it uh, arguably it was an excellent summer to do stream bank inventory. And so they've got that going. Yeah, that's but, true. But, but I, what I haven't heard from Sharon is, have they identified the consultancy who will be the lead group actually preparing the plan update? She's been very apologetic. She basically always in her upbeat way says, we're gonna, we're gonna do this, we're, we're getting this done. It's just that they are very, very uh, overtaxed in terms of their staff. They did just get permission, I believe it was at the last SMC meeting to hire 10, consultants, but I believe that all those consultants are going to be working with the money that, that Grant just talked about, but perhaps that will free up some of their regular staff to get back to some of their other things. So we need to find that out. Well, I understand that they want to do that 25 million. Can they spend 1 million uh, on Mud Lake? <laughs> <laughs> we don't even need a million for Mud Lake to make it um, to make it a fantastic, uh, uh, what should I say, interceptor. Any other questions? I'm just watching the time here and we're at exactly an hour. Um, um, any other Jim, I have a question. So for the station upgrade, have you assigned uh, prices to the equipment that's needed? Is that something that Gloria wrote into the December grant? Um, the Sierra Club application, or are we waiting for those numbers? Uh, RJ is getting those numbers for us. I, I texted him during the meeting. <laughs> okay, well, let's get some money for that. Yes. And I'm sure Joe will be very excited to have an upgraded weather system. <laughs> oh, did I just say RJ? I meant Joe. I was texting you, Joe. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what we're what we're doing right now is we're getting a quote from the provider that uh, 
that we got the lake level sensor from so that we can add the temperature for both the water and the air at the dam and it'll be available online for everybody and it'll track it all, which would be fantastic. The uh, anemometer is a little bit trickier of a deal because neither my house nor the dam gets great wind. Um, we're both pretty well shielded. I'm down in a hole kind of, and over by the dam is pretty well locked in with houses and trees. So trying to figure out a viable place to put one that also has the proper infrastructure uh, to be able to record the data and to be powered. And so that's, that's the trickier one, but we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> Joe, hey, you got a, a ballpark? Is it, are we looking at 500, 5,000, 20,000? <laughs> uh, I would say including the anemometer, like less than two grand. I would be surprised if it's that much. Cool. Okay. And that's, and, to, and I would imagine that would be with like a little bit of finagling power from point A to point B and yeah, like all in, it shouldn't be both of the thermometers. I think I'm expecting to come in at about a couple hundred bucks a piece. And then the other guy is the other guy. Perfect. Uh, yeah. The, and the more pieces you can break it up into uh, the grant I have in mind, I'll talk to you, Rachel. Um, would, yeah, and, uh, grant, I'm a little confused about SMC and staffing and things like that, because they've got the grant. Yeah, you have yeah, to spend money grant. on that grant within a certain time limit or they lose it. Well, and that's one of the things, uh, I mean, the when we started this whole 319 process two years ago now, the state capital stormwater program had not yet been announced. <laughs> and and um, who was it who, re, who retired? Um, yeah, having lost uh, Mike Warner. Mike Warner was ahead and, of it. and also even uh, Craig Taylor, the board member uh, so we're just noticing that uh, SMC is really going through a transition right now and trying to figure out. But, how but, to... but Jim, we, we, we already talked that over with certainly something that, you know, when we have that uh, back and forth with Sharon is a very key question. I am certain that during all of the things that have happened with the pandemic, I, I am aware of other grants uh, more than ever being extended. You know, usually there's a grace period on, on almost all grants, but I think during these very unusual times, uh, that's something that uh, more and more is being, uh, there's more flexibility in how long it takes yeah. to use that. What I would do is to en encourage you to uh, kind of stay on top of that, mm -hmm. to get an idea of what the um, period of time is for the grant. Uh, when the money is supposed to run out and what the prospects are for getting time extension for doing the work. Yep. And yep. in the meantime, in the meantime, one of the things that we could take advantage of is trying to get the folks from IIT, uh, that is Dr. Lambert, that's his, that, that's his um, specialty, is doing modeling. So one of the things we could do is to start to get H and H modeling from IIT. Uh, Dave Lampert is doing modeling with Nora at IIT for the Squaw Creek watershed. Okay, well, um, I, I just want to move us along here, and so I'm also a participant. Uh, it's always a good challenge to go through this. Yeah, I am. Hey, thank you, folks. I'm Pose to Sharon that we set up with Mike Priscilla and Sharon Osterby a Zoom meeting in within the next month, and we'd invite you, Jim, Gloria. You could participate. I'd have RJ there too, and um, and go through a mini version of the state of the lake and state of the watershed and start pushing this along from our side. Jim did send this and, and did, just so everyone knows, Jim did send this presentation, I believe, to Sharon on January 5th. So just last week, she did acknowledge it. She said they would be taking a look at it. So, um, you know, hopefully that line of communication will you know, continue. Okay. To you know, I, 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 
and you'll excuse me. I'm going to bow out for tonight. But thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank, thank you, you so Jim. Much, Jim. Thanks so much, Jim. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Great presentation. And since we are talking about money, it's a great segue transition into the next topic, which is grants. <laughs> With Rachel. Well, let's see. Um, Gloria and I pursued the NIFWIF grant as far as we could take it. And we decided we had this whole plan that we were going to be, we had, it had to be on public land. So we had identified the uh, Long Lake area. Gloria, step in and tell me the name. Long Lake Natural Area. In the Round Lake Area Park District. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so we still have it in mind. Um, we're, but we don't think we're not going to be able to get to the get it done before January 25th. So it's probably something we're going to work on this year. We're going to start building the pieces of it and uh, try to stack some grants up to meet the match and build our relationships with the partners because five star means we have to have, you know, five partners. So um, meanwhile, we have some other grants on the, on the to-do list, right? And, uh, you know, we'll just keep plugging away. We'd like, I'd like to do some wetlands restoration, you know, riparian restoration. We've got some, we've got some different ideas in mind. Uh, Rachel, did you make any contact at all with the park district then or uh, with Round Lake Park District, which is? Well, we had a meeting with ILM and ILM had a meeting with the, their contacts at the park district. Right. And they were interested, um, of course, because they don't have a lot of money, I guess, and they have a lot of land to restore. And then we also had a meeting with Jonathan Kepke at a company called, what's the name NCAP. of the company? NCAP. Hmm? NCAP, right. And that was really interesting too. And I followed up with him. Uh, I followed up. He gave us a lead to a guy who does his grant writing. Um, the last name Gray. Is it Tim? Was it Tim Gray? And um, I have a meeting with him scheduled for next week. I want to pick his brain. You know, he's a guy that does a lot of the grant writing for that for NCAP. So, um, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. And then um, well, I was going to say today I went to a, a Des Plaines, a DuPage County um, webinar that I, ILM was giving the presentation for the president of ILM. So it gave me kind of a better understanding of the scope of the type of work they do and the type of equipment that they use. So I think that'll be helpful um, for me when it comes to like conceptualizing other grant applications. Very good, um, uh, Gloria. I, I just want to interject one one bit of sad news that uh, Rachel and I found out meeting with ILM. Um, I have been waiting for years and years to get our watershed based plan so that SMC in their uh, kindness will write our 319 grant for us every August 1st. They uh, stopped that program this last August 1st, and we don't know if it's coming back ever. So there you go, sad note, sorry. Well, and I think that's also a realistic result of the DCEO program and all the hands on deck at SMC. Um, they're focused on that and they're doing grants for that. SMC used to provide lots of help to the different villages and they basically at one of their meetings earlier, I guess at the very end of last year, told all the villages we can no longer help you either. They just don't have the staff. So what were the letters you said? The, the, um, the program you mean? Yeah. I'm sorry, it's called DCEO. It's the oh. Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity at the state. And it's a capital program that has been given to Lake County $125 million over five years. And so it's basically swamping everything else SMC is doing. Okay. Any other 
Oh, Jack, you're, uh, you're crack breaking up oh, there, yeah. or you're mute. How much longer will we be recording? Let's see. Oh, Connor? <laughs> no, I just noticed how much longer were we going to plan on recording? Oh. <laughs> Thank you for announcing. Yeah.